The Brewers needed these last 36 hours. This is probably the happiest they've been since the trade deadline. A lot's gone down. The Brewers sweep a two-game series over the Rays, recoup again today, another off day, and get ready for the biggest series of the year to date. The Cardinals are coming up tomorrow. Don't go anywhere. You're locked on. You are locked on Brewers. Your daily Milwaukee Brewers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Good morning. It's Thursday. Thank you for being with us. I'm Dominic Catronio. This is Locked On Brewers. Apologies for no episode yesterday. For those who don't know, with my TBS job, working with Brian Anderson doing stats, makes it a little tough to do a podcast for a game I didn't watch. Uh, This week, had some stuff going on, but we'll get back onto it. So apologies for not having an episode yesterday. So we're back after it here today. And what a good one to jump into. As the Brewers walk off on the Rays, they shock them in the final two innings and win 4-3 to three in 10 innings. As the Brew crew, simply put, they needed that one. We're going to get to a mini-game recap. Not so much plays that you missed, just because not much happened in this game. Sing the praises of Hobie Milner and the rest of the pitching staff. And just... Wax poetically and just kind of look from the outside and try to settle everybody down as we get ready for this big home stretch coming up. The Brewers are at 60 wins now. They are now 60 and 50. There are 52 games to go. They are one game back. Now, I'm recording this while technically the Rockies and the Cardinals are playing, but it's Cardinals just put five runs on the board in the first, so I figured it was safe to jump in here and record. Uh, let's operate under the assumption that as you wake up this morning, the Brewers are still one game back of the Cardinals. And the Phillies won yesterday, which is important to to note, given that they are also one of the teams that are involved in this wild card chase. And the Padres won yesterday 13-7. to So as we reiterated at the very start of the season, I'm not sure that the Central is strong enough to have two teams represent and make it into the postseason. The Padres and Phillies are going to make things very tough for that final wild card spot with the way things are looking right now. You know one of the wild card spots, the top wild card spot, is probably going to go to the second place team in the East, which right now is the Atlanta Braves. Then you look at another wild card spot, will likely go to the Padres, but it's not for certain yet at this point. And then you look at what the Phillies have got going on, and then Milwaukee is the next man up. San Francisco continues to free fall. It is a three-for-two spot race right now with the National League wild card. San Francisco is now seven and a half games out of a wild card spot. They are out, in my opinion. They're not getting any better. They still can't hit. So this is a Philly, San Diego, Milwaukee problem, and St. Louis. The Brewers' priority is going to be the division, is going to be catching these Cardinals. And with seven games to go head-to-head, that's your last opportunity to claim a tiebreaker. Remember, they do not have the tiebreaker on Philly, and they do not have the tiebreaker on San Diego. It's not going to be easy. But the Brewers have an opportunity, despite the past 10 days and how brutal things were getting and how ugly Brewers Twitter was getting, it seems like there's a light at the end of the tunnel now. A lot of folks are feeling a lot more optimistic now because you just got to let it play out. Okay, thanks for coming to see the light on this side. If you still think they're not going to win the division, that's fine. But they got 52 games to prove it. And this is the stretch they are about to enter. We talked about it on Monday's pod. It's gut check time. You're facing the hardest stretch of opponents coming up. Then you'll have another mini stretch like this coming up in September where you got the Yankees and the Mets and the Cardinals. This stretch right now, Cardinals coming up this weekend starting tomorrow. Dodgers at home for a four-game set midweek next week. You go to Chicago, you go to Los Angeles, then you come back home for Chicago. That's a tough stretch. I know Chicago isn't the team that maybe team that you would say like, oh, you don't need to worry about Chicago. The Brewers have struggled against them this year. And it's always rocking at American Family Field when the Cubs are in town. You have to identify that. It's a hard place to play with that much environment, with that much energy going on, animosity at your home crowd. Nobody ever expects that. But it's always fun to win in those kind of games, but it takes a lot out of you. The Brewers are 6-7 and seven against the Cubs. Don't think this is going to be a, a rollover. And when you're at this point of the season, teams like the Cubs, teams like the Reds, Teams like the Marlins, who gave their best effort with Sandy Alcantara yesterday against the Phillies, 
try to be spoilers. They try to make things as hard as possible for the teams trying to get into the postseason because this is their postseason, playing these meaningful games against teams that are in the playoff hunt. The Cubs will have plenty more games with the Reds, plenty more games with the Pirates where they won't feel as competitive. But these are the games that they get hyped up for because they're facing a good team. Do not overlook the Cubs as you get ready for the Cardinals this weekend, but it's only one game at a time. The reason why this is the most important series to date, and it sounds so like because it continued to move that goalpost, of course, we'll kick that can down the road further and further. It's just because it's in division. This is so much more important than the seven games head-to-head with the Dodgers. In my opinion, it's because you can go three and four against the Dodgers. You can probably even survive going two and five against the Dodgers and hang in there. That would uh, spacing to happen, especially if you buy yourself some time by winning this series against the Cardinals. So again, we're operating with the Cardinals up by one game on the Brewers right now. Brewers win this series, boom, they're tied with the advantage with four games to go head to head. The next time the Brewers see the Cardinals won't be until Tuesday and Wednesday, September 13th and September 14th. It would be after an off day in which the Brewers will finish a stretch of playing 18 games in uh, 17 days. Then they go to St. Louis for those two, come right back home for that tough stretch with the Yankees teams, or the New York teams, the Yankees and Mets. And then they'll go back, or they'll host St. Louis one more time at the end of September. So again, kind of like how we talked about you won't see the Cardinals until after the trade deadline a month ago. Now you're sitting here saying, this weekend, you won't see them again for a month, and then you won't see them for another two weeks after that. This is going to be huge to have yourself a little bit of breathing room because if you win this series this weekend, you get the opportunity to split the final four games and you have the tiebreaker over the Cardinals. Don't go anywhere. This ser- this division is coming down to the final week. I think I've said it probably 40 times now this season. It's coming down in the final week. So just having a little bit of an advantage, having a little bit of breathing room makes all the difference in the moment. Because when we add them all up at the end of the year, this is a massive weekend ahead of us. Just wanted to jump in about that real quick. Don't get caught up with the Dodgers. They're a good team. They're supposed to beat the Brewers. The Brewers want to be competitive against them. What I see with the Cardinals series, though, is the Brewers are going to face their best. They're going to face Jordan Montgomery. They're going to face Adam Wainwright. They're going to face Miles Michaelis. You wonder if the post-Coors effect will be negative on Miles Michaelis after he got rocked on Tuesday. But maybe his adjustment coming back to sea level will be tougher for him. I don't know. But you're seeing their three best. Their bullpen's been decent. Hicks is back healthy. Uh, Gallegos has been very good for them. We obviously know about Ryan Helsley. They're a good team, okay? And it's not going to be easy this coming weekend. And it wasn't easy yesterday. Let's jump into the game recap here uh, in just a second. As the Brewers win in extra innings. 4-3, 4-3, to three, 10 innings, Rowdy, Telez, and way to go, Big Randy, as Christian Yelich says. As we jump into the game recap, before we do so, remind you once again, you've heard me say it over and over about the Blue Nile anniversary sale happening right now. 40% off on fine jewelry, 25% on engagement ring settings. Amazing savings available at BlueNile.com, the original online jeweler. They've been doing this since 1999. And Blue Nile is committed to ensuring the highest ethical standards that are observed when they're sourcing their diamonds and jewelry. It's why they have the best quality in the biz. Whether you're designing diamond stud earrings, if you're customizing an engagement ring, which they have amazing easy tools to do online at BlueNile.com, Blue Nile will allow you to create a bigger, more brilliant piece than you could ever imagine. And at a price you won't find at a traditional jeweler. And if you need help, you can get expert advice 24-7 and 30-day returns with their legendary service, guaranteed service and repair for life. And their diamond price guarantee means whenever you compare a diamond price from their site to somebody else's on a competitor's site, most cases, Blue Nile can meet or beat that price. So again, Blue Nile anniversary sale happening right now. BlueNile.com. Every order is shipped for free. It's insured, and it arrives in discreet packaging. It won't give away what's inside. Just need a simple special gift. If you're thinking about popping the question, if it's a birthday coming up, an anniversary, think about Blue Nile and give something special and make your moment sparkle. BlueNile.com today. Wow, what a game. Brewers win 4-3 to and 
for a while, it looked like they were going to coast. Then it looked like it was going to be nail brighter. And then it looked like they were going to fall in tough fashion. And then all of a sudden, they get off the deck and win it. Once again, though, a left-handed starter stymies the Brewers. And we talk about seeing the best from the Cardinals this weekend. They're only going to face one lefty. That's tomorrow in Jordan Montgomery. They miss Jose Quintana. Hallelujah. But Jordan Montgomery, a lefty over from the Yankees tomorrow. Keep that in mind. Jeffrey Springs, quick sidebar here. Hand up. Bias about to show here for a second. Jeffrey Springs is a friend of mine. Uh, I've covered him in the minor leagues, as is Pete Fairbanks in the bullpen for the Rays. We were all together in the Texas Rangers organization. I root like hell for Jeffrey Springs, except when he plays the Brewers, of course. But watching him carve the Brewers with his changeup, I was the least surprised person in the ballpark. Put some respect on Jeff Springs' name. He's been a very, very good pitcher the last two years for the Tampa Bay Rays. He's now got a 2.56 ERA in five innings with eight strikeouts, did allow two walks and those two runs in the first, but he even pitched better than that. It was a two-out rally that formed out of nowhere. The big one he wants back is when Hunter Renfro was at bat with McCutcheon on second and two outs and still nobody across. He got Renfro to swing and miss on a first pitch and then four consecutive pitches out of the zone. Springs lost it for a second there. He couldn't find it, and then the Brasso pitch, he was out in front of a slider, but got just enough wood on it to have it drop in left field. And the big reason for that is that the only reason Kutch was able to score is because there were two outs. If there was one out, he would have to hang up to make sure that ball doesn't drop, and he probably would have got the stop sign at third base. Keep that in mind. So he only scores because there's two outs. And then the second run scores. Keston Hira, salute to you, man. Your bat died a hero. Broken bat flare out in front on a changeup in the left center field. It got the job done. Situational, timely hitting for the Brewers. Springs did not pitch bad in this game. At one point, seven of eight outs were via strikeout. The only two runs he allowed were in that first inning. The Brewers were opportunistic. Their only two of their three hits with runners in scoring position came in that first inning. The other hit, of course, the one that ended the game by Willie Adamas. They went three for six with runners in scoring position, which tells you two things. They cashed in when they had the opportunity. The catch is, they just didn't have many opportunities. Springs and that bullpen pitched very well. Brewers fans, I think, understand what good pitching looks like. And I think you can sit back now, going back and watching that game, saying, man, that is some really good pitching. And it wasn't even about the Brewers chasing pitches, or it wasn't even about uh, questionable strikes, in which I didn't think it was that bad. Maybe a couple of pitches off the inside corner, but I thought Ryan Blakeney was fine. It wasn't anything egregious, in my opinion. Brewers know what good pitching looks like, what using all three of your pitches, mixing things up, changing speeds. That's what Jeffrey Springs did. Whether he was left-handed or right-handed, that would have worked very well against any lineup in yesterday's game. So the Brewers certainly fought and clawed and tried to keep themselves in this against Springs, and then it's always tough against the A bullpen of the Tampa Bay Rays. Let's talk about the Brewers, man. Brandon Woodruff. Weird start because he didn't walk a batter. He had it, as I described talking to Vinny Rotino at the game yesterday. It seemed like he had a little more behind him. He completes seven innings for the first time this year, but he actually exits trailing in this game, allowing two solo homers. He only allowed four hits. He only allowed four base runners. But two of them were solo homers. The other was a leadoff double, and the last an RBI single by David Peralta. Seven innings, three runs, all earned, no walks, five strikeouts. He faced 25 batters. His ERA is down to 3.52. He continues to turn in quality start after quality start. That's his sixth quality start since coming off the injured list out of nine total all season. Great stuff from Brandon Woodruff. Again, he has been a different pitcher. Saw him touch 99 a couple of times. Yu Chang and Randy Rosarena run into a couple of fastballs, and I think Woodruff would like those fastballs back, specifically to one to Chang. He wanted it up, missed it right down the middle. I don't care what... How much you've played in the big leagues, you're in the big leagues for a reason. Most guys don't miss that pitch. Made him pay. But Woodruff, another great outing for him. And it's always tough because, remember, Brandon faced these guys for his first outing on June 28th coming off the injured list, and he dominated them. Looked like the Brandon Woodruff of old. It's hard to do that back-to-back times. But he still pitched very, very, very well. Brewers going down the box score here. Nobody had multiple hits in this game. But it seemed like everybody had a little hand in the game. Everybody, uh, except for Colton Wong, who did not start the game, and Victor Caratini, 
uh, reached base except for those two guys. So Yelich draws a walk. Adamas, the RBI single to win it. McCutcheon, the double and run scored in the first. Brasso, an RBI single in the first. Renfro, a single and a pair of walks. Hero, the RBI single in the first. Uh, Rowdy Telez, the home run in the ninth. More on him in a second. Luis Arias, a single. Tyrone Taylor actually didn't reach base, but he was the winning run as he was on second base. The perfect guy to run in the bottom of the 10th inning. Before we jump into Rowdy's home run, I, I, I don't... I didn't do a, you know, hey, here are plays that you missed just because nothing happened. I like to do those after walk-offs because what we tend to do is only remember the walk-off. My Brewers MVP this year, Hobie Milner. Holy cow, man. He uh, continues to just thrive in the big moments when he's expected to most. He's becoming a sidearm left-handed Brad Boxberger, meaning his heart rate never increases. You don't see emotion in either direction from Milner. You don't see him frustrated. You don't see him excited. He's a robot out there. And that's exactly how you need to be in the role that he is in. He has now inherited 27 runners. Three have scored. In that eighth inning, it was do or die. The Brewers are down three to two. Brad Boxberger struggled again in the eighth inning, pitching in back-to-back games. He only got one out. He allowed three base runners to load the bases. And Hobie Milner comes in. And this is why Hobie's appearance was so important. He comes in to face the lefty, Brandon Lau, knowing there's only one out. You're not banking on a ground ball double play. It would be nice. But there's three consecutive righties to follow. Now, transport yourself back to 2021. And let me tell you that, hey, the Hobie Milner you're watching in 2021, he's going to come in in this three-batter minimum era with one out and three consecutive righties coming up after a lefty. Do you think Craig Council's crazy? You would absolutely say yes. I have the numbers. Last season, righties hit 361 off Hobie Milner. This season, they're hitting just 236. Last season, they had an 1187 OPS right-handed hitters against Hobie Milner. This season, 640. That's almost a full slash in half for Hobie Milner this season. The home run ball was his bugaboo last season. He allowed eight homers, all of them to right-handed pitching. And why or right-handed hitting? Why is it so important to identify righties? It's because he's a side-arming lefty. Prior to joining the Brewers, he's what we used to know affectionately as a Lugi guy. L O G U Y. Lugi means left only guy. Okay, that, that's an old school phrase that's kind of gone now because of the three-batter minimum. He's somebody that a lot of folks and a lot of analysts in baseball thought, hey, last of a dying breed, you know, he only gets lefties out. Who knows if he's going to be able to stick around as the, th- as the three-batter minimum has arrived. And looking into the numbers, he's always got lefties out. It's always been his job. So the fact that he's adapted to get righties out and he gets back-to-back looking strikeouts of Brandon Lau and Isak Paredes, to leave the bases loaded and get out of it without any further damage. What a full turnaround for him because so many folks were worried about him when this rule was instituted and he has made the adjustment. The actual adjustment, in case you're wondering, is completely scrapping his four-seam fastball. Last season, his four-seam fastball was arguably one of the first worst fastballs in all of baseball. And opponents hit 377 off his fastball. He doesn't throw hard. He relies on deception. He relies on his arm angle to fool you. 377 against the fastball. That's not going to cut it. Four of his home runs allowed were on the fastball. He only throws it 89, 90 miles an hour. And he threw it about half the time last year. He did have some natural sink to it, but it wasn't a real sinker. So this season, kudos to the Brewers and their pitching brass. To sit down and say, hey, forget the four-seamer. He's thrown it 5% of the time. this year. It's effectively gone from his repertoire. Let's just focus on a boring sinker. That really, and boring as in, like, as in it bores in on your hands if you're facing a lefty. Really going what we call arm side run. If you're not familiar with that term, picture yourself as the man on the mound, the pitcher. It could be easy to say, oh, it breaks into a righty or it breaks into a lefty, but you don't know what hand. You just say, hey, Hobie Miller's a lefty with the sinker with good arm side action, meaning the ball breaks toward his arm side. That's what you would expect from a sinker from either whether you're a right-hander or a left-hander. His changeup has good arm side tumble where it falls off the table, and the slider breaks hard to his glove side. 
going from the pitcher's perspective from left to right. There's a little bit of inside baseball for you if you didn't know about that. Using the sinker this year, remember the four-seamer last year, 377 average against. Also, the average exit velocity on that pitch last year was 87 miles an hour. This year, on his sinker, opponents are hitting 282, so about 100 points less. He doesn't throw hard. He's going to give up contact. We know that. He's not a strikeout pitcher. And the average exit velocity has actually dropped by three miles an hour. But it's not just the sinker. His secondary pitches have been elevated as well. Both his curve and change averaged over 90 miles an hour exit velo last year. This year, both of those pitches are under 82 miles an hour. He's among the top percentiles in hard hit rate, average exit velocity, and lack of barrel rate, despite having being in the second percentile, second lowest percentile in curveball spin, fifth lowest percentile in fastball spin, and fifth percentile in fastball velocity. He's 31 years old. He's reinvented himself. He's figured it out. And in my opinion, he's the Brewers MVP just because of how many jams he's been able to get the Brew crew out of. Again, 27 inherited runners, only three have scored. What an outing for Hobie. That was incredible. Tip of the cap again to him as... He just gets the job done. I don't know where the Brewers would be right now without Hobie Milner, especially as we move forward without Josh Hader. We're going to talk about Josh coming up in this final segment, and I haven't even talked about Willie and Rowdy yet. That's coming up next in just a moment. I want to tell you about one of our newest sponsors here on Locked On Brewers. Pure Health Research wants to help you out. If you're struggling with a bloated belly, if you're feeling tired and sluggish, if you've got uncomfortable digestive issues, you may just have an overworked liver as Pure Health Research has the liver health formula that can help you cleanse and gently detoxify your liver. You can restore comfortable and regular digestion, you can reduce belly fat, and you can fill your days with renewed energy. And as a listener of our show, you can try the liver health formula risk-free today, and you'll get a free bottle of CurbFit with your order. CurbFit is a safe, all-natural appetite suppressant, making it easier to say no to those naughty foods. So go to getliverhelp.com slash MLB to learn more with the liver health formula from our friends at Pure Health Research. Again, getliverhealth.com slash MLB. Let's talk about the ninth inning. Rowdy Telez was on the bench today starting against the left-hander. He had the day off. And he comes in once Springs exited the game. And they were righty heavy in the bullpen today for the Rays. But with the short bench the Brewers are carrying right now, There aren't uh, any backup infielders now that Wong was already in the game too. So Jonathan Davis and Mario Feliciano is the extent of the bench. Rowdy's got to be in there against the lefty. And the batter, or the pitcher was Brooks Raley, a left-handed, or excuse me, Colin Poche, a left-handed hitter. Rowdy, first batter of the inning against Poche. And he's only got, of his 22 homers, only two of them this season had come off of a left-handed pitcher. Enter Poche, enter a 3-2 pitch, enter a line drive to straightaway center field for his 23rd homer of the year that takes the team lead away from Willie Adamas. A line shot for Rowdy. Man, this dude, it's just so simple because the clubhouse obviously loves him. The city obviously loves him. I can't think of another comparison than Bobby Portis. And I've tweeted this before too for Bucks fans listening. And it's not just because of the Rowdy chants and the Bobby chants over at Pfizer Forum. It's just that I look at Bobby, never really given a chance, always a good role player wherever he was in the NBA. And you look back in the title season, was finally given opportunities a little bit more off the bench, was shooting well, was playing good good enough defense, rebounding with the adding some size for the Bucks a couple of years ago. This isn't a Bucks podcast, I promise. You can go check out Kane Pittman on Locked On Bucks if you want that. But I compare it to Rowdy because dude never got a chance with Tampa Bay or excuse me with Toronto. Always knew there was somebody else coming behind his back and the trade and he gets to be freed up and he's embracing it. The city loves him. The revenge game he had against Toronto was epic. The two homer game in the Brew Crew jerseys a month ago. And Willie gets that revenge arc here. More on that in a second. But Rowdy has been just everything the Brewers could ask for for what he's been this year as they've given him the everyday first baseman job. Yes, he got the day off with the lefty on the mound today. But look at his numbers. Yes, 239 average. You're like, well, that's not that great. Well, league average right around 245. 
So as a slugging first baseman, to have a league average batting average, you're like, okay, that's fine. He's well over league average in OPS at 808. League average in that's in the 730s. Absolutely love that. 23 bombs, you're absolutely loving that. 20 doubles out of the first baseman? Sign me up. And an underrated fact about Rowdy Telez is his lack of strikeouts. He really doesn't strike out all that much. 81 Ks and 365 at-bats, that's 22%. In today's baseball, it feels like it's 25 30% for most guys. And for, again, a slugging first baseman, he's going to end up with over 100 strikeouts, obviously, but he's going to end up with over 500 plate appearances. I'm in. Sign me up for that. What a great year for Rowdy Telez. His 23rd of the year to tie things up in the bottom of the ninth, just barely scraping over the wall in center. Let's talk about the top of the 10th inning now before we get to Willie's walk-off. Devin Williams, back. No Taylor Rogers. It was revealed after the game on Tuesday that he had a cortisone shot in his knee after Sunday's game. He's not going on the IL, but he's not going to be available uh, in these two games against the Rays. With the off day here today, maybe he'll be available again this coming weekend against the Cardinals. And Devin was down on Tuesday in that same situation when Matt Bush came in to close it out because Craig Council said he wanted to give Devin a day given he had pitched in four of the last five. It's been a stressful week. Totally understood on that part. We all wanted to look at the velo readings from Devin Williams. He's back. He's fine. 94 again from Devin. Didn't see any 91s or 92s. He actually threw a cutter in this game too. Totally fine with that. It was Craig Council having the heartbeat of his team, knowing the pulse of his team, knowing when a guy needs a breather. He gave him one, and he rewards him facing two batters in the top of the 10th inning is all he needed to get three outs. That was an awesome 10th inning. Top to bottom. It was an awesome game, top to bottom for the Brewers. This felt like a playoff game. 30,000 fans, tough team, good pitching, timely enough hitting. Taylor Wall is the grounder to first base to open up the 10th. And Rowdy Telez, I think there are maybe three first basemen in, in the league that even think about making that throw. I think of Freddie Freeman, I think of Paul Goldschmidt, and I think of Matt Olson. And Rowdy Telez pulls it off. And don't lose sight of the fact that this was clearly premeditated. They've talked about this because Urias broke straight to third as soon as he saw that ball hit as hard as it was straight to Rowdy. There was no hesitation. Urias read that just as well as Rowdy read it, and they were on the same page. That was huge. Perfect throw from Telez, perfect tag from Urias. First out of the inning, he got a runner on first now. Ground ball could end the frame, but didn't even need that. After a foul ball on the first pitch by Siri, on the 0-1 offering, change up, swing and miss, runner going, Caratini from his knees throws out walls. Third time he's been caught this year in 11 tries. An amazing falling tag by Colton Wong again. Blink, and there's two outs. And then three pitches later, Devin gets the strikeout on a fastball elevated and ends the inning. He technically only faced two batters, got three outs. What a day for Devin Williams to get back on track. He earns the win in this one, in a game that the Brewers needed. And it only took two pitches in the bottom of the 10th inning for Willie Adamas, his fourth career walk-off hit, and his first with the Brewers, which is shocking enough, but it was against his former team. The revenge tour for Willie Adamas. He didn't have a great series down at the Trop. We've talked about how he troubles, has trouble seeing the ball there, there at the Trop. He comes home. Didn't have a great day uh, necessarily on Tuesday. He was 0-4 for 4 at this point of the game yesterday, but gets the base hit through the left side, wins the game for the Brew Crew, and what a day. What a fun day. I want to wrap this up off day today, and I didn't mention this at the top of the show, but tomorrow I want to do a mailbag episode again. Now that things have calmed down a little bit, uh, I want to get your thoughts. So as you're listening to this, go ahead and hit us up at Locked On Brewers or at myself, at Dom underscore Catronio. Uh, I didn't realize that the DMs were not open on Locked On Brewers. I just changed that. They're open now. So if you ever want to just DM a question at Locked On Brewers, my DMs are open as well. Guilty, though, I am a little late on checking those sometimes. But you can always DM us a question as well on Twitter, at Lockdown Brewers at Dom underscore Catronio. It's in the show notes. You can check it out there or respond to one of our tweets. That'll be tomorrow's episode with the off day today. So mailbag coming tomorrow's episode. As I wrap up this, I want to make one quick note about Josh Hader. Josh Hader blew the save on Tuesday night with the Padres against the Giants. Giants kind of have his number this year right now. And I know a lot of folks are 
on the fence about how do they feel about the Brewers now that they've traded Josh Hader and they've traded the contender. I, I also don't want it to devolve into only rooting against a player to fail because he did nothing wrong. He had no say in the trade. I just want us to tread carefully and professionally, if you will, like a good fan base would. You don't root for failure for another guy. But at the same time, it's a weird, delicate balance. It's like, well, the only way you're going to feel better about the trade probably is if he looks like July Josh Hader as opposed to April and May Josh Hader. Do you get what I'm saying? I don't want to root for his failure. I really don't. And I don't want to encourage fans to root for his failure. But the trade happened. And when games like that happen for Hader in San Diego, I think Brewers fans remind themselves, yeah, he, he wasn't exactly invincible in July. Maybe the Brewers were onto something here. Uh, and what we talked about, and I talked about in the immediate reaction of the trade last Monday, was the Brewers probably felt this was their last chance to get good value out of Hader. If he does implode in the second half, or maybe he has a poor postseason, that value would be gone in the offseason, and the Brewers would be criticized for, oh, you held on to him for too long. See how it's a cat? The Brewers could never win in that trade. So they had to do it. David Stearns has stood by that trade. Matt Arnold has stood by the trade. It was a hard week, but hey, it feels a lot better now. Not because Hater failed, but because the Brewers are playing better baseball. Keep that in your mind. When the Brewers play good baseball, they're going to beat a lot of teams. Whether Josh Hader or Devin Williams is closing, or even Matt Bush is closing, or Taylor Rogers is closing, they're a still darn good team. Brandon Woodruff going seven innings and only allowing three runs. Eric Lauer going tomorrow. Corbin Burns going on Saturday. Aaron Ashby going on Sunday. That's a darn good staff. I'm all in, man. It's going to be a lot of fun. 52 games to go. Big series starting tomorrow against the Cardinals. Man, I can't wait. It's going to be a fun weekend. It's going to be fun. Tune in on Valley Sports Wisconsin all weekend. Mailbag episode tomorrow. Tweet in your questions. I'm Dominic Catronio. Thanks for listening. Until next time, keep on swinging. You are locked on Brewers. Your daily Milwaukee Brewers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.